They say life can change in a second. Mine changed in eight seconds. That's how long it took from the moment the truck swerved into the oncoming lane until I regained consciousness in the overturned vehicle. Multiple fractures. The doctor said it would require lengthy rehabilitation, at least six months of bed rest. Laura, my wife, stayed brave. We'll manage, honey. I'll take extra shifts at the clinic, she said. But we both knew my insurance wouldn't cover enough medical bills were piling up like a snowball. I called for help. Margaret, my mother-in-law, I'll take care of Ethan while Laura's at work. Mom, are you sure? She replied. It's difficult. I'm a retired nurse, remember? This isn't my first time, she assured her. So Margaret became my caregiver at 50. She had retained not only her professional skills, but also a remarkable grace. Her touches were confident and gentle at the same time. We need to turn you on the other side, she would say to prevent bed sores. At first, I was terribly embarrassed, especially during intimate procedures, but Margaret remained professional. Come on, Ethan. I've been in medicine for 20 years. For me, a body is just a body. Laura would leave early and return late. Sometimes I heard her crying in the bathroom. She's strong, Margaret would say while wiping my back. But it's hard for her. I feel like a burden. You'll get better. Her hands glided across my skin, professionally massaging the muscles, but sometimes it seemed her touches lasted longer than necessary. Does it hurt? She would ask while massaging a particularly tense area. No, not at all. In such moments, a strange tension would hang between us. She would look away, and I would pretend to be dozing. One evening, Laura called. Sorry, honey. I'll be late again. Emergency surgery. It's okay. Margaret's with me. I'm so grateful to Mom. I don't know what we would do without her. I didn't know either, but with each passing day, I felt Margaret's presence becoming something more than just help. Do you want a sleeping pill? She asked, adjusting my pillow. No, let's just talk. She sat down beside me in the twilight. Her profile seemed especially sharp against the fading light. Days merged into an endless succession of procedures, conversations, and touches. Margaret spent more and more time with me. Tell me about yourself, I asked. About your youth? about how you met Laura's father. Why do you want to know? She replied. She would sit in a chair by the bed, crossing one leg over the other. Her house dress would rise slightly, revealing her knees. I was like Laura, she said, just as determined. Nursing was everything. And then I met Thomas and fell in love more like gave in to passion. You know that feeling when your mind says no, but your body. She stopped short, meeting my gaze. But your body. My voice grew husky. Never mind. Let's do your exercises. Physical therapy was becoming increasingly torturous, not from pain, but from her touches. We need to work the muscles, she would say, massaging my legs. Otherwise, they'll atrophy. Her fingers slid up my thigh. I held my breath. Does it hurt? No, Margaret. She paused for a moment, then pulled away. That's enough for today. At night, I couldn't sleep. Her image haunted me 
the curve of her neck, the scent of her hair, her casual touches. You're not sleeping well, she noticed. In the morning, maybe take a sleeping pill after all. No, just thoughts about what. I know what. She turned to the window. No, Ethan. It's wrong. And what's right? Pretending nothing is happening. But we both knew that was a lie. Something was happening, something dangerous and inevitable. Laura called less and less frequently. Work consumed her completely. She was wearing herself out. Margaret, I said, when she's helping me with dinner, I'm worried about her. What about yourself? About what's happening between us? I stopped, but her hands trembled as she wiped my lips with a napkin. One day, during a massage, our eyes met. She leaned too close. I could feel her breath on my face. Be quiet, she whispered. Just be quiet. It happened on a rainy Tuesday. Laura was on night duty. Margaret was giving me a massage. Turn on to your back, her voice trembled. Her hands glided across my chest, lingering longer than necessary. The room was hot despite the working air conditioner. So I caught her hand. She whispered, don't. But she didn't pull away. Look at me, she said. She raised her eyes, reflecting the same madness that was burning me from within. We shouldn't, her lips trembled. I know, but we couldn't stop anymore. Her lips found mine. Hands tangled in hair. The scent of her perfume made my head spin. Rain drummed against the windows, drowning out our voices. She smelled of jasmine. My fingers trembled touching her silk dress. Each touch made my heart beat faster. She pressed closer, whispering my name. The pain in my joints receded, replaced by something stronger. The world narrowed to this room, to just the two of us, to the sound of rain outside. Afterward, we lay in silence. The rain wouldn't stop. What have we done? She whispered. What we wanted to, I answered. Don't talk about her, she said. Not now. She stood up, adjusting her dress. This was a mistake. Do you really think so? No, she turned to the window. And that's the scariest part. The phone shattered the silence. Laura, hi, honey. How are you? Fine, I tried to speak calmly. Is mom there? Yes, I'm here. Margaret took the phone. Her voice didn't waver. Everything's fine, dear. He's almost asleep. Thanks, mom. You're an angel. Margaret turned off the phone. We looked at each other. We're monsters, she said. I know. This can't happen again. But we both knew it would, again and again. The following weeks turned into a dangerous dance on the edge of an abyss. Every time Laura left for work, we lost control. This is madness, Margaret whispered, kissing me. We've gone crazy. I couldn't disagree, but stopping was beyond our power. During the day, she remained a professional caregiver, measuring blood pressure, giving injections, helping with exercises. But her touches burned even through latex gloves. Your recovery is going well, she would say in front of Laura. You'll be walking soon. It's all thanks to you, Mom, Laura would smile. You take such good care of him, Laura would add. If only she knew how. At night, 
When Laura was on duty, Margaret would come to me. Moonlight silvered her graying hair, and time seemed to stop. We must stop, she would say each time. Each time we must. I would agree, pulling her closer. During the day, we were tormented by conscience at night, by passion. You know what's worst? She asked once. What's worst? I don't feel guilty, only fear. Fear of this not ending, that I won't be able to live without you. I understood her. With each day, our obsession with each other grew stronger. Laura began to suspect something. A woman's intuition, she said. Mom's so different. She seems younger, really. And you're different, too, more alive. I stayed silent. One day, Laura came home early. We barely managed to spring apart. What happened? She asked, seeing our flushed faces, his temperatures up. Margaret said quickly, I was just checking it. Should we call a doctor? No, we answered simultaneously. Laura gave us a strange look. What's going on with you? Nothing. Margaret adjusted her robe. Just tired. That night, she didn't come. I lay awake staring at the ceiling. Laura breathed quietly beside me. The phone vibrated softly. A message from Margaret. We must stop before it's too late. It's already too late, I replied. Ethan, you have a letter. Laura handed me the envelope from the rehabilitation center. I took it with trembling hands. Margaret froze by the window. They're ready to take you in a month. Laura, she beamed. Isn't that wonderful? Yes, wonderful, Mom. Did you hear? Ethan will be able to walk. Great news. Margaret's voice sounded hollow. Rehabilitation meant the end, the end of our meetings, our madness. Later, when Laura left for work, Margaret burst into the room. We can't continue like this. I know. No, you don't understand. I'm going crazy. Can't sleep, can't eat. All I think about is you. And I think about you. This is destroying us. She was right. We were losing weight, not sleeping, living as if in a fever. What should we do? I asked. Run. Leave somewhere far away. Start over. What about Laura? What about our life? She was almost shouting. I love my daughter, but I love you too. For the first time, these words were spoken aloud. Ethan, don't say anything. Just think about it. That evening, Laura returned. Troubled? Mom's been acting strange lately, haven't you noticed? No. And she's gathering her documents, renewing her passport. I thought maybe she's planning to travel. I suggested maybe. Laura pondered. You know, she never really recovered after the divorce from my father. Always searching for something and not finding it or finding the wrong thing. She looked at me intently. Ethan, do you know something? No. What makes you think that? I don't know. I just feel like something's happening. That night, Margaret came for the last time. Her kisses were salty with tears. I bought tickets, she whispered, to Spain next week. Ethan decide. Either everything or nothing. For three days, I didn't sleep, 
torn between duty and madness. Margaret didn't come, saying she was sick. Should we visit Mom? Laura suggested. No, I answered too quickly. I mean, let her rest. The night before Margaret's departure, I made my decision. Send her a message. Come over. I need to tell you in person. She came in the morning after Laura had left. Her eyes were feverishly bright. I can't. She sat down, as if her legs couldn't hold her. Why? Because it will kill Laura. Because it's madness. I'm already dead without you. No, listen. She grabbed my hand. I've never felt anything like this, even in my youth. It's like a fire. Either we burn together, or we extinguish the fire before everything burns down. Ethan, she recoiled, you're just afraid to be happy. I'm afraid of making everyone I love unhappy. And do you love me? I was silent. She laughed bitterly. I see. I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry for believing that we could. The front door slammed. Laura stood in the doorway. Mom, aren't you sick? We froze. A terrible silence fell. What's going on here? Laura looked from me to her mother. Nothing. Margaret stood up. I just... What? Steel rang in Laura's voice. Why do you both look like you've seen ghosts? Laura, I started to speak, but she raised her hand. I'm not blind. I saw everything all these months. Sweetheart, Margaret stepped toward her. Don't. Don't dare call me sweetheart. You both of you. She burst into tears. I'm leaving. Margaret said quietly, forever without him. Laura laughed bitterly. Yes, he chose you, and you chose betrayal. Margaret left without looking back. Laura and I were left alone. Why? She asked. I don't know. Do you love her? No. And I'm not sure I can live with this. She left too, and I remained alone in an empty house with an empty heart, destroyed by my own hands. A week later, a postcard came from Spain. No signature, just a phrase. Sometimes the right choice is the wrong choice.